Good morning. Uh, right, as Mateo said, my name is Ram uh, Ramaswamy, um, and I'm presently at IIT Delhi. And uh, in this course of lectures on uh, on the collective dynamics or collective behavior of some kind in complex systems, I want to largely discuss the behavior, the dynamics of coupled systems. And um, for reasons that are, that are almost obvious, one looks at oscillatory phenomena. Uh, there is not just transient behavior that might go away after a while, or not just things that never change. Uh, so we want something that changes in, in some fashion. Uh, most of the time, it will be periodic. A periodic motion, that is motion that repeats exactly after some specified amount of time. Or it could be quasi-periodic, which is a little variation of uh, periodic behavior, or even um, uh, chaotic behavior, because that is somehow the most common behavior in the world. Right? Um, now, the kinds of things we will talk about uh, I mean, many of you may already be familiar with it because uh, synchrony, especially with Steve Strogatz's book and podcasts and infinite number of TikTok videos and so on and so forth, this is a very common thing. Uh, but I'll also talk about its variations. Uh, I want to talk about things that have uh, you know, names like um, death, amplitude death, uh, aging, stasis, et cetera, and uh, also more, quite interestingly, symmetry breaking, uh, which is uh, dynamical symmetry breaking, which, is, which brings all this into the realm of uh, statistical physics. There are phase transitions and so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, so this roughly is the plan. Uh, the topics that I will try to cover is what is synchronization? Uh, you know, starting with the oldest uh, observation, at least the oldest scientific observation by Christian Huygens. Uh, I'll talk about that experiment, its theory, and how we understand it. Uh, I'll also try to uh, then uh, segue into a discussion on uh, phase transitions and synchrony. What is the similarity between the two? Uh, and uh, this is particularly important in, in a model which can be solved uh, exactly. It's called the Kuramoto system, the Kuramoto model. Um, because um, you know, chaotic synchronization is, in a sense, one of the more interesting aspects of synchrony. Um, you know, how do systems that never repeat themselves and are unstable everywhere and so on and so forth, how do those systems synchronize? Now, that is also an important uh, aspect of, of the subject. Uh, and then there are variations called generalized synchronization, et cetera, et cetera. But I will try to talk about it from a geometric point of view, uh, on, you know, using the ideas of uh, manifolds and so on. Um, then, as I mentioned already, symmetry breaking is going to be important. So I will discuss what are called chimeras. Um, then I talk about networks because nowadays all complex systems are networks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and finally, one of the more interesting recent-ish developments. Um, you know, the subject's going back to 1665, all right? So, so from 1665 till today, there's been a lot of, lot of developments, particularly after the discovery of chaos in this area. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, interesting uh, thing also introduced uh, to, by uh, Steve Strogatz called swarmulators, namely things that swarm and <coughs> sink. Okay, uh, so this is something of current interest. Okay. Now, <coughs> I mean the, so uh, one of the reasons one studies synchronization is that this is one of the most common forms of collective behavior uh, that's seen in nature. Um, I mean, there are simple uh, examples that surround us everywhere, particularly from biological systems. Um, 
all of us are examples of something that is very heavily in sync uh, with the sun uh, because we depend on the sun for so much of our energy uh, that it's always useful to have, uh, to have processes that keep some kind of a 24-hour cycle because that's where you know, the, the period is, uh, the Earth's rotational period is that. So such rhythms are called circadian rhythms, and these are there in virtually all organisms uh, from bacteria onwards, all right? Um, there's a lot of synchronization that's going on in our brains. Uh, you know, a lot of the you know, neurons spike uh, simultaneously uh, in order to retain some forms of memory. Which ones are spiking together? Um, so there will be, uh, there is a correlation between the kind of memories you form and the kind of synchrony that it in, that, you know, sounds or uh, various external stimuli induce in your brain. Uh, if possible, I will talk about some uh, current examples that are studied in neuroscience. Um, other social phenomena which are known to be synchronous is, uh, for example, when groups of people walk together, uh, then they fall into patterns, particularly if they know each other well, uh, like groups of friends of varying heights, so varying lengths of uh, steps. Um, you know, I don't know, if you might have noticed that when people go out together, they start more or less walking together and so on. Uh, so this is, this is a social phenomenon which is an example of synchrony that is, um, that is in different units. And one of the things that's necessary of, is uh, some interaction, right? Um, okay, and before I put on the video, let me just show you an ex I mean, another thing that happens if you go to a stadium, you find Mexican waves forming, right? And one person starts and then suddenly it goes on. Or if you go to, an, particularly good performance, you find synchronous clapping. You know, people get into a mood and then it's that, 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 you know, it goes on, right? Um, I mean, this crowd is big enough and we can try for an example of that later on, okay? Uh, you can hear whatever sound this is. This is the Millennium Bridge in London and when it opened on 10th of June 2000, uh, you can see the crowds that are... There are many videos on YouTube, so if this one is not clear enough, notice how suddenly you find groups of people who are walking together in sync. And this was bad enough that the bridge became known as the Wobbly because it was shaking from side to side. That's particularly obvious now, right? So this can actually be a major problem. Armies, when they walk across bridges, are told to not walk in step, but you know, armies that march are always in step, and they are told to stop being, you know, break file is the command or something, because otherwise you'll just get your natural rhythm of uh, your walking tuned with the bridge, and bridges have been known to collapse because of that. Anyway, so they had to go and fix this. This was a, it was a big disappointment for the city of London and a huge opportunity for people who study synchrony and chaos and so on. You know, a number of papers that have come out on this, are quite a few. Okay, but in nature, there are these fireflies in Malaysia, particularly. The fireflies are not moving themselves, or oh, one or two of them might be, but otherwise uh, they are largely static and they flash in unison because uh, they are trying to attract mates. Uh, only male fireflies flash, but the synchrony that emerges, you know, just go again. Oops. Right? So you can see that I mean, this is not the best example I've seen that I've seen, you know, 
entire trees just light up after a while because all of them are flashing together in unison. Now they're not, they are communicating with each other mostly in response to another male's flashing. This one gets into sync and tries to be brighter or something, I don't know, more attractive in some way. So, I mean, the, the precise reasons, etc., are only hypothesized because these are not easy experiments to do, but you can observe them. Also, the observation of this has inspired a lot of uh, theoretical work trying to come up with models that could start uh, synchronization, and this eventually led to the Kuromoto model, which I will talk about uh, in some detail. But, and here I have to actually thank our director, Matteo, uh, there are other forms of uh, behavior uh, that could be seen as some kind of synchronization. So here's uh, an example of fish that are schooling. Uh, you know, when they are not in the schooling formation, they are just moving around randomly. Uh, but something happens, maybe a shark somewhere, and then they all start uh, forming these shoals that are all traveling together. Uh, and one can see that there is, there is order, there is short-range order. So it's random motion that is just, and because the fish are uh, sort of long, you can think of pneumatic ordering, if you like, if you like the language of uh, liquid crystals or something, right? But this definitely, uh, you know, one can see more than just the fact that they form a group that moves together. They're all aligned in, you know, at least locally, they're all aligned, right, in the same direction, because otherwise they'd be crashing into one another. So the emergence of this kind of spatial and temporal uh, pattern, if you like, uh, can be seen within the framework of synchronization. And when I discuss uh, generalized synchronization, I will talk about it. Uh, you remember your comment, uh, Matteo, in the, right? The, well, <laughs> I took it very seriously. Uh, all right, so uh, here's another example. Okay, and by now, anybody who studies complex systems has seen this and, you know, Nobel Prizes and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of very beautiful work on active matter and so on. Um, and here again, I want to point out that there is the emergence of at least short-range order. They are not all flying together in, uh, in some straight lines or even some general. I mean, these are groups that form and reform and so on and so forth, okay? Now, the reason why I believe that it's useful to think of this as some kind of synchronization is that these patterns can be engineered. Uh, swarms of drones, for example, as we have seen in recent uh, applications, shall we say, uh, drones can be made to swarm, and that dynamics is not very different from this. Right? Uh, also, when you look at the uh, when you look at these kinds of murmurations, they are called, right? Uh, when you look at them in some detail, and with the eye of an artist, uh, you find a representation uh, like you see on the uh, on the right hand side over there, right? Uh, so again, what the artist is able to see, and I will show you photographs later on. Uh, of the actual birds in flight is that these, uh, again, there is short range order. Uh, there is definitely some kind of uh, emergent property over here because the bird doesn't, it, I mean, it's, it infers a pattern to be maintained uh, through years of evolution and all that, of course, but it's there. Okay. <laughs> right. Now, as I said, the first mention of synchronization was by Christian Huygens in 1665 or thereabouts. Um, and uh, Huygens, as most of you, I presume, know, uh, did a lot of work in, in early days of mechanics. He invented the pendulum clock. 
um, and so on and so forth. Right? Lots of stuff, ray optics. I mean, right. Now, uh, what he observed was, I mean, he, he observed this phenomenon and made some very explicit uh, notes which he communicated to his father and so on and so forth. Uh, but what he basically saw was that if you hanged two pendulum clocks on a common, uh, wait on. All right. So here's the two pendulums, uh, and here they were hung on a on a common beam. And what he observed was that no matter where you started the uh, uh, the pendulums from swinging, after a while they were almost. Uh, after a while, he saw that they were swinging in a manner such that this pendulum reached its extreme, that is, this position. Uh, or whatever this symbol is, at a time uh, at, when it reached this, this particular pendulum was on this side. So both these pendula were going to their extremes at exactly the same time. Uh, however, there are two ways in which they can do it. Both of them can reach their left extreme together or their right extreme together. But this was happening in a way such that both of them reached their outer extremes first and then their inner extremes so that they were oscillating essentially out of phase with one another. Right. Okay. Now, what he observed by and large was uh, this situation and um, it's anti-phase synchronization or out of phase or whatever. Uh, and this would be the case of in-phase synchrony uh, namely, that uh, it would reach one; the extremes would be reached at the same time. Uh, so, just to make the point even more obvious, here are the two phases of the two oscillators, and they are just displaced a little for uh, clarity. So, the two of them are exactly in phase. Over here, they are out of phase. And what uh, uh, Huygens saw was mostly. Uh, he saw the other one also, but not for very long. And uh, when you do the experiment again, uh, three centuries later, in the early 2000s, uh, there was, um, there was uh, an interesting paper. I'm going to give you reference, all these references uh, so that you can read them on your own as well. Uh, what you find is that uh, uh, you, know, you start it off any which way. And these are not long enough to see the uh, thing, but you can see that both of them are on their outer limits at the same time. So you, this is the common thing that one sees. All right. Okay. Again, uh, from YouTube, and there are even more spectacular videos. I just let this play and then we'll talk about it. No, they're not touching each other, but notice that this baby here is moving. He is also in sync. <laughs> All right. Now, what I wanted you to observe over here um, was, uh, I'll just go back and play it if necessary. Uh, you saw how they were just set off randomly, right? And then they came into a stage where two of them were, they were actually anti-phase. That wasn't stable, right? And then it went out of sync for a little while, and then it came back, and where everything is now in phase. Right? So the pendulum hanging from the top was largely out of phase. The uh, system, the, uh, these are metronomes. So the metronome system, it's largely in phase. Right? And you can, like I said, and this is only with four, but you can see you know, thousands of them if one likes. Right. Now, what we are seeing over here 
uh, is, you know, demonstrations of this general idea of uh, synchrony. And uh, yeah. No, these are periodic, right? Because this is, metronomes are used for uh, musicians to keep time. So they need, you know, definite beat. So you, these are all periodic, right? You cannot actually make a chaotic metronome. Uh, I mean, I suppose you could, you could make anything chaotic, but a metronome by itself, if I just left it on the table, is designed to be periodic. There's a spring that you wind up, uh, these are actually not very expensive, right? And uh, so you, you wind up the, uh, the, the spring that releases energy, and then it just keeps the time. Usually, you know, people go for an eight beat, if you're a musician. But these, when you want to do an experiment, you go for a little faster stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah? Here, they took the same period in the beginning for each uh, metronome, right? Yeah, very close, all right? And this is going to be the point. Uh, you know, if two identical systems, everything identical, 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 perhaps one is not so surprised because the motion has, uh, at some point at least, tell me your names so that I don't have to say he, him in the blue or him in the gray, right? Um, that you, uh, you, st you start out as close as possible, right? But because there are small variations, uh, even in a hanging pendulum, there's lots of technical things in making it as a good timekeeper. Uh, Huygens' experiment actually made it impossible. He made these pendulum clocks that were good timekeepers to the level of something like 15 seconds in a day. Right? That was how accurate they were. But because they could synchronize with some comparable movement, they could not be used to determine longitude. Right, so that actually is a major problem, and if uh, and there's a beautiful book called Longitude, um, which you may like to read at some point in time, because even though it's it's, it's a historical book, but it's a lot to do with our history, you know how we invented, basically, you know how we were how it was possible to go from my continent to yours, presuming that we are from different continents, of course. Okay. Yeah, 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 good. Is it important that they are on the same platform which starts oscillating as well? Or si. Yeah, okay. But that it starts oscillating is not important. That it is uh, not infinitely heavy so that it damps out any, you know, what is necessary is for one system to recognize through the medium that the other one is there, all right? Even if it's very heavy, still there is some small transfer of energy. Yeah, it works. When it's very heavy, I will discuss some examples, okay? Um, right, yeah. It, it's nice. See, the, the things that are important in all this is how different are the natural frequencies of these isolated systems? If they are very close to one another, then one kind of synchrony is possible. If they are not, they will, I'm just going to discuss that in a minute. Uh, there's going to be another kind of, uh, there are other possibilities, let's say. Right? But uh, that's important that they be close. The other thing that's important is the amount of damping in the both intrinsic damping through the medium maybe, and the strength of the coupling, which is really dependent on the mass of the base or the, the suspension and the uh, mass of the pendulum and so on. I mean, is it the, the mass or is it more something like the con um, conductivity of the waves in the, like the speed of the sound or something like this? Is that um, the I'm not sure that those are, I mean, those are all clubbed into one phenomenon. The theories of all this are phenomenological. Right? So it's not as if we are looking at material properties and so on and so forth. Okay? But it's not important that it be on a swing. Uh, I use this video mostly to show, because the motion is very visible. Right? You can 
see that, but it shouldn't give you the impression that that is a necessary condition. So uh, now, two uh, uncoupled pendulums uh, with slightly different frequencies are, I mean, they're going to be uncorrelated, right? One second. All right, so if one pendulum has frequency omega 1 and the other frequency is omega 2, uh, if they are almost similar pendulums, then um, let's say, if that is the condition, then coupling them somehow makes these two pendulums pull each other to a common frequency. Namely, this one will go to some new frequency omega 1, this will go to some new frequency omega 2, uh, and those will be identical. All right? So that's what we are seeing. Uh, you know, if one was to take a measurement, the two we saw the uh, uncorrelated pendulums when they were starting. Each one of them had frequencies which were almost the same. But then when they were in sync, you could even hear that they were at exactly the same frequency. So this process of going from to this is called generally entrainment. Okay, So the two oscillators get entrained with one another. Right. This entrainment is, uh, is possible. Should I move to this side? Is it easier? No, no, no. <laughs> this is not meant to be a strain on your, at least not on your body. Right, so, okay. Uh, See, the equation of motion for a pendulum is something like, uh, let's say, x1 double dot plus omega 1 squared x1 is equal to 0, or let's say i. Right? So I mean, just as, for small oscillations, I'm just considering it to be a, a simple harmonic oscillator over here. Right? Um, it, it turns out that, of course, these two pendulum, the other one, uh, okay, so both of them are out here. Uh, omega 1 maybe is something which is like this, where p times omega 1 is roughly equal to q times omega 2. When they are, you know, identical or close to identical, p and q are both 1. Now, it turns out that the process of entrainment is actually powerful enough that you can actually drag this approximate relationship of p omega 1 is equal to q omega 2 uh, <laughs> or more to the point if I've got my eyes on you. <laughs> yes? Um, do p and q are... Uh... Integers. Yeah. All right. So, um, this kind of entrainment is possible even when p and q are, when this relationship is there. Uh, but it works best when p by q is rational and small. Okay? By, so p by q is rational and they have no common divisor, so that's down to its minimum form. And uh, this kind of entrainment works very well if p is 1 and q is 2, or vice versa, uh, 1 and 3, 2 and 3, etc. You, you, you get the idea, right? These, uh, you know, 311 by 297 is not a good idea, right? Because we'll, we'll just see why that is the case. Right. Um, okay. So, now, um, the solution for this is basically something like xi of t is some ai uh, cosine omega i t plus bi, right? So this is straightforward, right? Uh, and when they are uncoupled, I'm not bothering to couple them at all, 
uh, what I would like to show you is that this dynamics essentially can be written in the form of a map. All right? And we'll just see how that happens. Uh, the, the x1 dynamics, if I write x1 versus x1 dot, is basically lying on a circle. Uh, you should stop and ask, uh, in case this is not familiar, almost everything I say is simple enough that it can be explained in a sentence or two. OK? OK, so this is the motion for x1 and x2. Right? So the first oscillator is going around at some frequency omega 1. This one is going around at some frequency omega 2. All right? And the combined motion, therefore, lies on a torus, all right? So this is mathematically S1, this is S1, and this gives us a two-dimensional torus on which the motion occurs, right? Now, the combined motion is therefore going to take place and so on. And the, I, is this clear to everybody that the motion of the two, no? Close the lamb. Yeah. Uh, maybe for the interest of those who are in the back, uh, if you can make a uh, right. Bigger picture? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in the interest of Ram, maybe next time if you can sit closer. There are two options, of course, either closer or far, far away. <laughs> no. Okay, I will uh, also speak louder and hopefully a little clearer and so on and so forth. Um, okay, now, to whom is this picture, you know, who finds this picture not immediately easy to understand? Okay, so uh, this picture, burn. Okay, great. So we understand that a simple oscillator is just something going around in a circle, all right? Because this is just folding x and x dot onto one phase space plot, right? Now, since the two of these systems are uncoupled with one another, consider the first circle. At every point of the first circle, there is another circle. And at every point, there's another circle, circle. So finally, what you have is a donut, all right? Or a bicycle tube, or a car tube, or whatever. Flaro? OK. All right. So now that we have this idea, the combined motion is going to go from here. It's going around one circle. So it's going around one circle. But meanwhile, on the other freedom, which is the x2 freedom, that motion is going around on this side. So finally, the combined orbit is going around and around and around and around. Yeah? Now, to try to make a map out of this, Poincaré basically said, let's just cut through this torus. And let us ask, when does the orbit come into the, uh, come and meet this cut? OK? And now, <clears throat> this is going to require a little bit of faith. This is actually a two-dimensional torus drawn on two dimensions in a world which is three-dimension. Actually, this is in two dimensions, and this is in two dimensions. So this is actually in four dimensions. Right? So when you cut through with this plane, you actually only get a cross-section of this torus. All right? You just get a cross-section of this torus. And we'll try to see what, how, uh, you know, how to see the dynamics on this cross-section. Right? And this was invented by Poincaré, uh, and it's called the Poincaré section. Yeah? 
Okay. So uh, to make things easy, I'm going to just remove unnecessary constants, right? And just consider the two phases of the two systems. So when you take the two phases of the system, um, what you have is, um, let me say, x1 is equal to cosine theta 1, and x2 is equal to cosine theta 2. I've just shifted things around so that unnecessary constants are not needed. And I want to look at the motion of the phase theta 1 versus theta 2. Uh, so see, theta 1 is omega 1 t, and theta 2 is just equal to omega 2 t, which is theta 1 divided by omega 1. Yeah? All right. So now let me try to understand how theta 2 varies with theta 1. Uh, I want to get rid of 2 pi. So Okay. I'm just getting rid of the 2 pi, uh, okay. and, then, and that divides out. I just get this equation. And now theta, theta 1 and theta 2 go they just go, uh, you know, so 0 to 1 is the same as 0 to 2 pi. Okay, it's in those units. Is that okay? I'm just, you know, because it's unimportant. Uh, okay, so this is theta 1 and this is theta 2. Uh, let me just draw this line. Yeah? So, but all this algebra is modulo 1. Theta 1, if it's, let's say it's 1.5, that's 1.5 times 2 pi. So I've got to remove that extra 2 pi, and this is the same as this number. So essentially, this is just periodic boundary conditions, right? So instead of this curve over here, what I have is I can just fold this back over here. Then I can fold this over here, and I can then fold that over there and so on and so forth. Yeah? Yeah? No. All right. OK. So let me start by asking, when does it first hit this line? OK? Let me call this point. Psi 1, all right? This point over here, when it hits the other integer, Psi 2, Psi 3, and so on and so forth, all right? So the uh, coordinates of Psi 1 are uh, the uh, x coordinate, or sorry, the theta 1 coordinate is just going to be, let me call this alpha, right? It's alpha, uh, oops, no. psi 1, is, the y coordinate is 1, the x coordinate is uh, 1 over alpha. Yeah? Right. This point I'm going to call psi 0, and this is just 0, 0. This is the origin. Right? Psi 2, is just 2 over alpha. Uh, two. Psi 3 is just 3 over alpha, 3 in general. Psi n is just n times omega 
n, where omega is equal to 1 by alpha. Sorry for a little Now I want to now make the point that this is 0 to 2, 2 pi, 2 pi to 4 pi. So this line is exactly equal to this line. Same way this line is exactly equal to this line. So if I were to just now look at this dynamics on the curve, the first point is here. This is from 0 to 1 on both sides, right? OK, so 1 is the same as 0. So, so the first point is here. The second point is here. The third point is here. The fourth point is here, and so on and so forth. In other words, psi n plus 1 is just equal to psi n plus omega mod one. You're not happy. No, no, no. Yeah, no, I'll just see the whole point is that all our dynamics in phase is only interesting from zero to two pi. So if I look at it in units of two pi, the dynamics is only interested in zero to one. Okay? So what this number does over here is just tells you how far you go on the line from 0 to 1 in one step, again on another step, but you've got to go past 1. So that's why the mod 1. And instead of this, I can just fold it up and, sorry. And look at the dynamics on, this is psi 0. This is psi 1, this is psi 2, and psi 3, etc. So the entire dynamics on the Poincare section is just a set. This is each time it comes back after 2 pi or 1. Right? And so the dynamics on psi is just a, a rotation on the circle. How much does it move each time? One omega, and omega is the ratio of the two frequencies. Now it's not difficult to convince yourself that the only way in which it will close is that if somewhere in the future it has to pass through the point over here or a point over here or whatever. Right? So the only way in which it will close is if the slope is rational. And why rational? Because this is now broken up into integer units. Right? So if it crosses itself, if it comes back to a starting point after um, you know, how many squares in this direction, how many squares in that direction, then the orbit will close on itself. Omega has to be rational, right? Big omega. Yeah, big omega has to be rational, which also means that alpha is rational, which also means that omega 1 by omega 2 is rational, and so on and so forth. Yeah? I'm, I'm only interested in when it crosses a particular. See, the idea of the Poincare section is basically to draw a line on this curve, on, on this representation, and say, tell me each time the orbit crosses that line. And for convenience, I'm taking this line. Right? Because this is psi 1. And the next time, it's moving the same distance because this length See, since this length is 1 and the slope over here, so this has to be exactly the same amount. I mean, this is just simple geometry, but get this because 
this is, is, is a, one of the simplest examples of what's called an ergodic system. All through StatMake, we study ergodic systems, right? But this is the simplest example, well, simplest in somebody's notation, but this is a simple example of an ergodic system. If omega is not equal to p by q, because if it is equal to p by q, then let's say it's one, one by four, all right? So, As the orbit goes around this torus, if omega 1 by omega 2 is just 1 by 4, you'll get four points, nothing else. Right? And this is very important sometimes because when you want to divide a pizza between n friends, you need to move by precisely some rational <laughs> some rational number, where <laughs> the one by n, let's say. Okay. Yeah. Now, if alpha or omega is not rational, then these points will not, you know, after one by four, if it's almost one by four, all right, one by four plus epsilon, which will make it irrational. Okay. Then. It will go around, and but the fourth time, let's say, it will actually come here, over here, over here, over here, over here, over here, etc., etc. It's too far in the lectures. Let's not talk about that right now. It's just, this is a, this is a simple thing called the rigid rotation of a circle. And so the dynamics of two uncoupled systems, right, is going to be represented by this. Supposing omega 1 by omega 2, yeah? Uh, no, if you're irrational, you will go around because you'll keep missing. You will never come back. Right? Yeah. If you are rational, you will only cover it by a finite number of lines. End of story. I mean, actually, you can see that. Uh, if if omega is not rational, if it is irrational, right? Then the points will eventually fill up the entire circle. Okay? That's, that is what is meant by ergodic. Okay? Um, have you all seen this book on classical mechanics by Arnold? Seen it in a library somewhere? On your laptops? No? Okay. So you'll see some of it in a homework. <laughs> Okay, so, so now we are, we are through as far as two uncoupled systems are concerned. Um, if I want to take this case over here, where omega 1 is approximately equal to omega 2, and let me assume that this ratio is equal to 0.9998765, some irrational number, all right? Maybe I don't need to go that far. Well, let's just sort of over here. Then let's say I start over here. The next time around, I will only, oops, sorry. Let me just draw my circle again. On iteration two, I'm only over there. The third iteration, I'm only over here. Because I'm not one, right? You know, omega is not one. So it just will keep on going, 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 etc. And then it will not hit zero again. It will go this way and so on and so forth. Yeah? So this is what is meant by ergodic. It's just going to go around. Now, now, let me try to see what is the effect of coupling these two oscillators. Right? I'm going to do the mechanics of it later. But just the idea of coupling them would be to say 
that um, uh, okay, some functions coupling them. It doesn't matter. All right. Now, so people have been studying different forms of coupling. We'll come to that, but. The simplest thing that I want to do is to actually uh, make this map. I, I, I want to just say that what effectively it will do is to change this map uh, just one, one small thing, let me just go back. One thing that I want to uh, just give notation, uh, omega is called the winding number. Okay, so the winding number is the number of winds that it does, right? So I can even, so if I take psi n plus one is equal to f of psi n, all right, then, I want to define it now as omega is equal to limit of n going to infinity f to the n of psi minus yeah and how many times I have done it when I've got this simple map you can see that Omega, this winding number, oh, sorry, this winding number is equal to omega for the simple math. Yeah? I mean, the limit makes no sense over here, but it's going to make sense for us later on. Right? Okay. So now I want to consider this f of n, where f of n is psi n plus omega, and for reasons best known to Arnold, he considered this map of a circle. Okay, mod 1 is there. Mod 1 is only important when you want to represent it, but otherwise, every point is equal to itself shifted by 2 pi, any numbers of 2 pi on both sides, right? Okay. So this is a very famous map, okay, and it's called the circle map, or sometimes it's just to be Specific, it's called the sine circle map, right? And when k is equal to zero, it's just the rigid rotation. What happens if k is small? Okay, you can see that, you see psi already is a variable that mixes up these two coordinates, theta one and theta two, right? So what I'm writing over here is a phenomenological, algebraically convenient form of some coupling between theta 1 and theta 2. Okay, and it's a nonlinear coupling. You can consider all sorts of other behaviors, it would be important. Okay, now the main thing over here is that as you keep changing k, you can ask how does this, um, how does this winding number change? Yeah? See, we were interested in the case of omega 1 approximately equal to omega 2 when uncoupled. When you couple them, do they come together or not? Yeah? Oh, it's not w index n, winding number. Hashtag winding number. Yeah? All right. 
So uh, this is what I've just been talking about. Um, okay, this is the... Uh, right, so that is it. Okay, so this is what was discovered um, and studied in great detail in the 1980s particularly. Right. Um, I should point out that, just one second, let me just give a disclaimer. Almost everything that I will give in these lectures is the work of many, many, many other people. All right? And I've taken pictures from the internet uh, with attribution for the most part. Uh, when I haven't attributed, it's not because I don't want to. It may have just forgotten where I got the picture from. All right? And this is as much for the YouTube audience, <laughs> if there is any, <laughs> as this. Anyway, so the point about this is that what was noticed by Jensen, Bach, and Bohr, and many, many other people, uh, Kadanov, Prakashia, Jensen, I've already said Jensen, uh, just a large number of people, right? Uh, the following. What is shown over here is the winding number calculated from that, all right, as a function of the strength of the coupling. Yeah? And uh, what we have over here, uh, okay, there is some interesting properties just coming from the fact that it's a sine coupling, and there is a symmetry between uh, around the line uh, half. I'm sorry, I never got back to you on the question. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, I didn't understand what's the definition in there and what's the consequence. Like, uh, we take uh, the coupling to be sinusoidal, and so we get the map to be that one. Yeah. Oh, F, F is just whatever is on the left-hand side, or on the right-hand side over here. This end, in, this, in our case, for the map, for any map, okay, for any map which is defined like this, I will define this to be the winding number. I start at some point, I just iterate for n times, divide by the number of iterations, so I find out on average how much it has moved each time. Yeah? No, no, no. In all cases, W is equal to... Uh, because there we have uh, the winding number and omega on the two axes, so then one is not the, the first state line. No, no. Okay. Not the first graph. The first graph is just this picture at this line. Ah, okay. So K is equal to 1. But then what's on the y axis? Just one second while I... <sighs> Just one second. Yeah. My question is, uh, what's on the y-axis on the first graph? Winding number. But, it's so, but the winding number is also on the x-axis. No, that's not the winding number. That, no, that, oh. Yeah, I know. Winding number is equal to, this is the definition. Uh, okay. for, th for this particular, you know, for the case of k equals 0, that is on this line, on this line, that was, right? Next, what, you know, then I increase the value of capital omega in my map. Then I calculate the winding number. All right? Now, if I keep calculating the winding number, it turns out that around every rational number, oops, okay, around every rational number, uh, 0 by 1, 1 by 1, 1 by 2, 1 by 3, 1 by, th you see all the rational numbers over there, yeah, uh, there is a small region which just all the, it, it just attracts all the nearby frequencies, and uh, so, for example, if your initial omega, right, was, let's say, 0.11, right, so let's say it was 0.1, initial omega is 0.1, and your k, the coupling strength is 1, right, then after a little while, you will just attract both, both of them 
to have this particular the frequency over here, which is 0 by 1. Little thought will tell you it's the same as 1 by 1. So if the coupling is strong enough, even if the ratio of the two is not very close to each other, eventually they'll come close to one another. That is the entrainment. If your, uh, if you, let's say your frequency, initial frequency is a half, so they are one by two, then obviously your winding number is one by two. But if it is half plus a small fraction, or all the way actually up till uh, almost 0.6 over here, or let's say about 0.55, all right. If your coupling is strong enough, it goes exactly as to one by uh, one by two. Okay. Yeah. Can you repeat what the winding number equal to zero means? <laughs> winding number equals to zero is the same as winding number equals to one, for the following reason: that on the, in this modulo one algebra that I'm talking about, the point one and the point, and point zero are the same. Okay, so zero, so zero by one is the same as one by one, right? So that it means identical. Yeah, it's like yeah, you just keep on coming back to that point. Yeah, thanks. Okay, now this is kind of important because also it's going to figure in a homework. Um, uh, I mean, dream up your function and calculate this picture. All right, that's, that's going to be the homework, but I'll write it out properly. And, you know, and if I find that too many people are dreaming up the same function, <laughs> that will not be a good thing. <laughs> OK, but jokes apart, it's not good. Are you clear about what is happening over here? As you keep increasing the coupling, nearby frequencies get attracted to one another if they are sufficiently close to rational numbers. Now, uh, you all, all know that on the line k equals 0, the number of rationals is of measure 0. Yeah? Almost every number to start with on the real line, if you pick a number at random, it is an irrational number. Yeah? Okay, most people and most numbers are quite irrational. <laughs> Please, okay, so you're listening. <laughs> all right. Now, by the time you get to k equals 1, all right, and this is an important line over here, but I'm going to give you the reference so you can read it. This is a beautiful three-page paper in Physical Review Letters. You know, it's worth at least looking at once. Okay, so on this line, what's happened is that this ratio one is to one has now actually taken up a large, large fraction. The precise length of that can be calculated. It is one over two pi. The width of that particular zone over here is 1 by 2 pi. This is somewhat smaller, that's smaller, and so on and so forth. You can see every rational number now has a little width around it where it has attracted all the close by frequencies. On this line, the irrational numbers have measure 0. So at k equals 1, no matter which omega you start with, you're very likely to, start, to end up with an entrained frequency, right? And for lower coupling over here, you can calculate something like that. You can, you know, it's easy to compute, and the definition is trivial, right? So you can calculate something, and you can see what is the width of these. Yeah? So, yeah. Okay, color white is irrational tori. And color light blue is, uh, sorry, dark, dark purple, whatever, whatever that number, that aubergine. Okay, so the aubergine uh, shading is for rational orbits, periodic orbits. Yeah? 
वन इज टू वन और इज एन ऑर्बिट दैट जस्ट गोज अराउंड लाइक दैट वन इज टू टू वुड बी एन ऑर्बिट दैट गोज अराउंड ट्वाइस इन वन डायरेक्शन एंड वंस इन वन डायरेक्शन लाइक दैट so if you if you took an omega of 0.9 or 0.8 no no 0.8 so if you took it at 0.9 and k equals 0.9 you'd find that the two the actual winding number is 1 yeah all right now this is a, this is an important diagram uh actually because this is a slightly more quantitative version of what arnold did and i just want to tell you that what happens above k equals 1 is that this map for the case of sin the sin circle map the uh, there are non differentiable points at uh, at certain parts of it so red gives rise to overlapping so these are called arnold tongues because it was first described by arnold uh when and this is just for normalization of uh everybody uh is it in student work done in 1959 he was a student of kolmogorov so this is what he is writing in a it's, it's a little difficult paper but anyway uh he looked at this particular map you can see that it's really the same map uh you know i mean you just change some uh, variables a little okay uh and here he proves that the the width of the tongue decreases as the power of the denominator of the um uh, you see the point a sorry should okay so a is the same as r omega right you know without the two pi taken out so a is 2 m by n uh where m uh, n is the denominator and the width of this of each tongue uh it goes down it decreases as epsilon to the power n epsilon being the coupling and that's why these uh these first ones over here 0 by 1 and 1 by 1 they go down as exact straight lines these are quadratic and cubic and so on and so forth and these increasingly high powers means that the with the uh, zones are narrow 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 so actually this line at the top when k equals to 1 is just covered by rational windows and there are gaps between them and those gaps contain irrationals so even at k equals 1 there are irrational orbits above that uh, over here these start overlapping once they overlap the dynamics gets really complex okay okay now this is to uh, you know wanted to just give you a flavor of why such you know this entrainment happens in nature we don't we almost always go for one is to one resonances or one, they are called resonances but you know whenever you've got systems that are almost identical then you think that the natural frequencies are the same or almost the same and then they get entrained what this tells you is that if they are close to some small rational numbers but not identical 1 by 2 or 1 by 3 or 2 by 3 or something like that then also you can have a very good entrainment right and that can be done experimentally and we are living in at least one experimental system where this phenomenon of entrainment is very important yeah just just to have an idea picture an idea of what you say so one when you say there are no no there is some overlap that mean that uh, th- does it mean that there are jumps in one of the directions in the trajectory like Uh, exactly? well it goes chaotic okay so when when the tongues begin to overlap <coughs> this is, 
Okay, at k equals one, uh, this is called the devil's staircase. It's called the devil's staircase because at every rational number there is a step. And if you step on each one of those rationals, it's going to take you an in, you're never going to get to the top. All right? So you can see some of the big steps, but believe me, everywhere you just have step, 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 fractal. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so the system that we are living in of entrainment, to which we are eternally grateful to external forces, well outside our control. Uh, all of you know that you only see one side of the moon, right? Warum? I mean, this is an international class, nine? <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, but you're, I mean, certainly this is the kind of question that would have been of interest to people, right? And why do we only see one side of the moon? I mean, if it doesn't keep you awake at night, <laughs> no. Okay, so the reason is that uh, the moon's, the reason why we only see one uh, side of the moon is that with respect to the earth, I mean, we go around once a day. The moon goes around us once in something like 27 days, 27 point something, all right? But the moon also rotates on its own axis once in exactly the same time. Okay, so as it is going around, oh, sorry, I can't, can't do it, but okay, I mean, maybe we'll make this the earth, and right? So as it's going around, it, it just keeps rotating in exactly the same, as the moon takes 27.3 days, it just goes around in 27.3 days. So the lunar day, so to speak, all right, is the same as its period around the Earth. And that's why we mostly see exactly the same part of the Moon. Why we don't see mostly it is because of Kepler, right? The Moon's orbit, if it was perfectly circular, then we'd see exactly the same part, but it's not, right? And, it's, and the tilt, there is a slight tilt of its axis with respect to our own axis. So sometimes we see a little more of the top, sometimes we see a little more of the bottom. But we don't see more than 60% of the moon anyhow. And the reason is that when the moon was formed, when the earth gave birth to the moon, so to speak, I mean, there was no fixing of angular momenta and so on and so forth, right? Entrainment for tidal forces to be somehow minimized on the moon as it evolved around over, I mean, we've been around for what, four billion years or so? I mean, not all of us, me closer <laughs> than you, <laughs> but we've been around for a long time. And the moon has had enough time to lose its energy, to slow down, until it just got into frequency locking, right? And this kind of tidal locking is there throughout our solar system. 20 out of 24 or 26 satellites that are known in the solar system are tidally locked. Right? And Mercury is another story that has, it rotates threes to one around the sun or some, you know, I mean, there are all these interesting uh, little uh, coincidences that come up. All right? Okay, now I'm going to uh, whatever we have. Um, you know, I have 15 minutes for this, but I really need to do a little more. So I will introduce the subject today uh, as as to what we'd like to understand. Is everyone cool and comfortable as far as uh, circle maps, entrainment, etc.? Bene. Kosi <laughs> Kosa? No? <laughs> I'm sorry, it was very dated Italian. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, now that we have an idea why these things do that, this sort of pulling of frequencies and so on, what we'd like to understand is how do we actually implement some of this in uh, 
uh, in, in a system, you know, we started by discussing synchrony in the Huygens uh, clock. Right? So what is the mechanism of this? Right? Um, I'm just going to say roughly what we are going to do uh, tomorrow. Um, because there's no point coming back to it later on. But this is a mechanical system, and at least the first approximation, uh, it is uh, it's actually quite simple. Uh, let's say, right, so the mechanical system I want to describe is two pendulums of, sim of identical mass, identical length, suspended from a common beam, and this common beam is, um, you know, for convenience, just got this particular property. None of this, none of these details is important. Uh, but as we discussed earlier, if I let the mass of the beam, which is capital M over here, go to infinity, all right, then essentially the systems get uncoupled. So the Lagrangian for this system uh, is. I mean, one just writes it down as one does with most mechanical objects. You've got the total mass of the system, uh, and the base is allowed to move, all right? And you can think of having a spring along the base, just a restoring one so that it doesn't slide off to infinity, um, all right? Uh, so here is the mass of the entire system and the velocity of the base, uh, and here is the corresponding potential energy, if you like. So you've got that. All right. And then you've got, uh, uh, here is the Lagrangian part, which is just corresponding to the uh, two pendula. You've got the you know, kinetic energy for the uh, pendulum, the angle theta 1, sorry, phi 1 and phi 2 is shown over there. I will probably call them theta 1 and theta 2 tomorrow, just whimsical. Uh, and this term couples the two. It's actually a talk, is, you know, uh, from uh, the, um, you know, it's a talk imposed by each pendulum on the, uh, on, on this entire frame. So that much is your uh, Lagrangian that you start with, right? And okay, so once you have this Lagrangian. You can write down the equations of motion for the two systems. That is, the systems being the individual pendula and the uh, entire base. And uh, okay, so let me just run you through this. Sorry, uh, yeah. now, uh, if I look at the interaction term, it does not come from a potential. That's not coming from a potential. That is just the velocity of, uh, it, it's a torque kind of a thing. I don't know what one would call it. Uh, but it's the velocity of your system that is moving and the velocity of the pendulum. Uh -huh. Okay. I have another figure then, which I will show tomorrow, uh, which makes So, it. but you derive it from mechanics. Yeah, it's derived from first principles, okay. so to speak. Yeah? All right. Uh, now, Ignore for a moment uh, this term and this term. Uh, this equation of motion is got just from looking at this Lagrangian and obtaining the corresponding equations of motion for each one, phi 1 and phi 2. So k takes the values 1 and 2. For the entire system over here, again, ignore that particular term. I've just got that. All right. Now, what this, uh, these two, uh, these are actually three equations of motion, two over here and one over here. Uh, this would be a conservative system because this Hamiltonian is conservative, all right? But we know that there is some amount of damping. There's phenomenological damping that just comes from um, the fact that the pendulum is in air. So that is written as B times phi k dot, all right? So this is just the, the uh, damping on, there's some number that will be put in later on, okay? I'm not getting into what kind of form it is, because this is just a simple pendulum. If you actually try to model Huygens' pendulums, because they were timekeeping devices and had to stay um, you know, active in a, in a sea voyage, 
the actual form of the damping is different and also uh, there's a need for external forcing so that these pendulums just keep going otherwise with just simple damping it would it would just stop moving after a while all right so there are extra terms that are added this is one th one extra term that is thrown in and this is the other extra term that is thrown in for the pendulums and for the base there is this extra phenomenological damping friction call it what you will uh, that is added in all right uh, this will be the starting point for our discussion tomorrow where we'll try to analyze this and see why the solution phi 1 plus phi 2 is equal to 0 all right so I, you see now i've got two equations here one for phi 1 and one for phi 2 and an equation for x right so I'm, I'm not going to be interested in the whole solution. That's something that I'll give you the references and you can look at. I just want to discuss the following situation. In-phase synchronization is given by the difference between the two variables. If I call a variable delta or theta or something, I don't know, let's call variable 1, is the difference between phi 1 and phi 2, and the other variable as the sum of the two variables then we'll see that one of them goes to zero. And the one that goes to zero, if the difference between them goes to zero, then clearly the motion is phi one equals phi two. Phi one minus phi two is equal to zero. Contrarywise, if phi one plus phi two goes to zero, that says that they are exactly out of phase with one another. Okay, so aim, aim of the game tomorrow will be just to see how we, we show that one solution dominates over the other, okay? All right, and this is complementary to the discussion of the, of the sine circle map, because the sine circle map is just all sorts of things just thrown into one. Yeah? And this will be specific to two pendulums and possibly two metronomes. And with that, let's meet tomorrow. Sorry, Ram. Yeah. So you should have uh, momentum conservation of the whole system here, no? Yeah. Which should uh, be... Just one second. Uh, so uh, do you, can you see it clearly from this... Uh, um, uh, from see, what you would really like is M phi 1 plus M phi 2 uh, dot uh, plus M x dot is equal to, is a conserved quantity. That's not easy to see because you've got both the input and the damping. Uh -huh. No, but say, I mean, if you just look at the Lagrangian. If you look at the Lagrangian... Uh, then... Uh, uh